I think there's a big challenge in public health all the time when you're looking at the common good, um, which often imposes on individual rights. Why would we want the government to be in control of our weight? The weight of the nation has been making headlines lately, thanks to a Washington conference and an HBO documentary using that very title. We could use policy, we could use the marketplace through taxation to really shape purchasing behaviors. Some would argue that we have to employ the same tactics to really reshape our food environment. The piece is based on the Institute of Medicine's nearly 500-page report rejecting the idea that individual willpower is to blame for the obesity epidemic. Their solution is a series of dramatic and systematic measures. But will these government interventions actually solve the problem? It's an access issue that we live in an obesogenic environment and that as long as um, we have ready access to cheap, affordable, low-nutritious foods, that is going to have an impact on our obesity levels. Dr. Lisa Santora is the chief medical officer of Southern California's Beach Cities Health District, the largest health prevention agency in the country. She wants more government dollars to help fight obesity. Prevention is under attack probably on a monthly basis right now to take away those funds and to apply it towards deficit reduction. But my perspective as a preventive um, medicine specialist is that we have to make these investments now. The government is already in a full-fledged war against obesity, with President Obama's health care reform including $15 billion for obesity prevention. And the government has been intervening in nutrition long before the Obama administration, arguably since the founding of the USDA. And people have just gotten heavier, with nearly two-thirds of adults now overweight or obese. Giving responsibility away from the person and putting it onto the government's hand is usually a pretty bad recipe. Cal Poly economics professor Michael Marlowe says that prevention programs all over the country are missing the mark, like this childhood obesity prevention program that Dr. Santora oversees. These efforts not only don't work, they send the wrong signal. The program's called Live All Kids and includes the student-grown gardens, workout programs, and produce in local schools as part of the health district's tax-funded $10 million operating budget. Every day, children have a salad bar and they have access to what we know is nutritious food. If you talk to most people, they know that they should eat green beans and not a bag of potato chips. It's not necessarily a knowledge problem. Yet they're using an approach that would indicate that people don't know what's healthy, like this nutritionist teaching parents how to tell their kids which foods are natural and which are fake. Natural. Hey. I'm not sure that we really need to have people trained in that sort of uh, an endeavor. But programs are going beyond trying to increase awareness. This New York billboard of an obese amputee is part of a massive government ad campaign to scare people into behaving a certain way. What's wrong with it is that it's based on paternalism. What they're saying are the following, that the obese don't really understand the health consequences of their obesity, that they have little incentive to deal with the obesity without government. So the government tries a multi-pronged approach, but ends up just stabbing at thin air. This has resulted in a very broad definition of what constitutes fighting obesity, and it can justify almost any type of spending, such as this federal funding for pet spaying and neutering in Nashville. The project was approved to prevent stray dogs from scaring people away from exercising outdoors. <laughs> Another one of the many problems with government intervention is that it's usually a one-size-fits-all system that's susceptible to corruption. Pizza is currently a vegetable. There's been a lobbying effort by businesses to promote their products. Having the uh, food police, if you will, come in and tell you what is a good lunch and what is not a good lunch is a recipe for disaster. Like when a North Carolina state employee decided that a preschooler's lunch, featuring a turkey sandwich, was not nutritious enough in accordance with USDA guidelines. The student was given chicken nuggets instead. I think there's a big challenge in public health all the time when you're looking at the common good. You want to create a healthy environment, but then sometimes that can impose on an individual rights where you say, well, you can't bring soda to school. You can't have that. And you have to really strike that balance. While these programs mean well, they often lack evidence backing them up. Banning soda or other junk food in schools is a good example. It's supposed to steer kids away from unhealthy food, but there's evidence to the contrary. One study reported by the American Sociological Association showed that weight gain really doesn't have anything to do with the junk food that could be purchased in schools. You can come in and try to control one's eating habit at school, 
but that isn't controlling how they substitute when they go home. But the government still wants to get rid of it. And when the government realizes that programs like these aren't working, it only leads to more aggressive programs that still won't fix the problem. What do you do when you see that your good intentions haven't worked? You will then say, hey, look, what we need to do is to push them a little harder. So we'll raise the taxes more. Maybe we should ban certain foods. We're going to come in with a hammer next time and really make you change your behavior.